Hello guys, and thank you for joining me today. So I found this little image that's been going around Facebook called, Are We Playing Right Into Their Plan? And you can see it over here. <laughs> uh, I wanted to do this and kind of show like how Christianity is not the mirror of this. So many people say Christianity is socialism. So many people say Jesus was a socialist and all this. And I like, I think this does a good job or it's at least a good base of where to start of how it's not that. So let's just jump right into it. There's a couple of things mm, that I wanted to go through first. And that is this in this picture. Okay. It says that this is all Saul Alinsky and it's not when I did a little bit of research on this, I'm just going to read what I took from the website. So the first is the eight point plan to implement socialism. This plan was not enumerated in Alinsky's book, but Alinsky inspired two Columbia university sociologist, Richard Andrew Cloward, and Francis Fox Piven to devise the Cloward Piven strategy, which seeks to hasten the fall of capitalism by overloading the government bureaucracy with a flood of impossible demands, thus pushing society into crisis and economic collapse. This strategy is often attributed to Alinsky and left-wing websites like Snopes have tried to discredit the plan by declaring it false because Alinsky didn't actually write the eight steps in his book. Okay, so, but Snopes doesn't attribute it to Cloward and Piven. And we all know Snopes can be a little iffy on what they say is true or not true. Or sometimes they just don't put all the information in there, like uh, in this case. So you can actually find this Cloward and, Piv Cloward and Piven list in other places. It's not just where I found it. If you look up Rules for Radicals, which is Saul Alinsky's book, you will find 12 rules and they have nothing to do with this. So this, so if you hear the words or the phrase, uh, 12 rules for radicals, this is not the same thing. So I just wanted to do that because I made that mistake whenever I was looking for it. Okay. I'm sorry. My kitty's in here. You may see ears or a whole body, depending on what he decides to do. Okay. So we're just going to go through this. And so this is going to be a little bit of a longer video. So I'm sorry about that. I know. So <clears throat> some people like longer form and some people don't. So I, I like longer form because I can really talk about it a little bit more. So I have notes just so I can keep myself on target basically. Cause I'll just ramble off. <clears throat> so the first one in here that it lists. Okay. Let me see, 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 let's see, let's see. Say, say eight levels of control. The first one's healthcare. Control healthcare and you control the people. So this list is healthcare needs to be given to the government, right? And so this is what they want to have ultimate control. So healthcare. In the Bible, it's very clear that we, the people, are to care for we, the people. All right. And how the Bible says that is this. 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. All right. Deuteronomy 15, 11, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. Okay. So most people who can't get health care is because they're poor. So if you, someone needs something healthcare wise, open your hand to them. And this is not saying the government forcing you to open their hand to them through taking it from you through taxes. This is saying you personally, you personally have an orbit of people that you know, friends, family, neighbors, acquaintances, people you work with. If they are having trouble getting healthcare for something that's legitimate, right? then it is all of our jobs to make sure that that person gets what they need. There's nothing in the Bible that says you're not supposed to do that. All right. So there's that. This is the Bible. This is the Bible putting it in the hands of the people, but not through the government. So that's why it's not socialistic. 
But that is why they can sometimes, they can sometimes trick people and say that it is. Okay, so poverty. Increase the poverty level as high as possible. Poor people are easier to control and will set, and will not fight back if you are providing everything for them to live. All right, so we can see this kind of happening in these, hmm, how do I say this? Lower income areas where you can't make the money, so you think you can't do anything. Excuse me. Or you think that if you do do it, it's just not going to be enough. So your will's down, your self-esteem's down, things like that. So you don't fight back. You think, well, I have to have this government because I have to have this because I cannot do for myself, right? All right. So again, that's Deuteronomy. Uh, Romans 15, 1 through 3 is also sort of covers this. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who approached you fell on me. And Deuteronomy fifteen eleven falls into this. And so does 1 Timothy 5, 8. There, there are four, let me see, one, two, three, four, five. There are actually five verses that you can actually use for all eight of these and then just go home. <laughs> you could you could actually be done. But for poverty, I found some more. So poverty, first John three seventeen. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So again, from me to the person, not from me to the government to the person, me to the person. Okay. <clears throat> I would even go so far as to say, if you wanted to, not me to the church to the person, it's me to the person. That's, it is person to person. That's how we're supposed to do it. If me and two or three other people want to pull together and all go to a store and purchase your, let's just say, medication, let's just say, uh, whatever it is. Okay. Um, sinus medication, you can't afford it for some reason, then we can all do that. But it's not, there's no middleman here. This is you and this person it's relationship building. It's showing the love of God to these people. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So this one also, I use Deuteronomy 15, but a more expanded version of it. So Deuteronomy 15 is seven through 11. If among you, one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God's giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your heart against your poor brother, but you will open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart and you say the seventh year, the year of release is near and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother and you give him nothing and he cried to the Lord against you and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him, because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. Okay, so this is once again me to the person, you to the person. It is not me to the government to the person, me to the church to the person. It is very much me to the person. <clears throat> so if you have a poor member of your family, your family is supposed to take care of that person. Some people are poor because they have medical, for medical reasons, or because they have physical deficiencies that make it impossible or very hard to do work that would actually gain them anything. So what the Bible says is that your not just your community, but more very specifically, your family is supposed to care for this person. It's not, let me go get you government handouts and things like that. It's, we will care for you. And so what does that do for this person? Well, it doesn't put their love or it doesn't put their idea of what they need in life towards the government. Okay. It puts their love and what they need towards their family towards even if you wanted to say the community at large came in to help 
Like maybe somebody bought that person food, so they live with someone, things like that. It puts their love towards the people around them. It puts their understanding of care towards the people around them. And then this person who maybe can only do so much will want to give back because so much was given to them. And that is most of the time how that happens. Whereas when you have the government, people then start getting this entitlement thing because they can't, there's no one in standing in front of you saying, I care about you. Here's this food. What happens is you're given like a card and said, okay, here you go. Here's some money, but check off all this stuff. It's a very different relational thing. And since we are very relational, that matters to our mindset. It matters to how we then see the world. So if you have someone who's poor in your family, consider helping them in whatever way that you can. All right. So once again, healthcare, poverty, we're supposed to do this, not the government, not even, I wouldn't even say the church. I would say the church as in, I would go to, let's say, <clears throat> Boiling Springs Baptist or whatever, and be like, well, I need this help. Well, then, you know, maybe they have a fund for that. But what I'm actually supposed to do first is go to my family. You see, so that that makes that stronger bond there. You could even t go the reverse of what I was saying earlier in that people who are given stuff from the government then have the same bond for fam for the government that they were supposed to have for the family instead. And so that makes them want to say, okay, big government's good, even though it's, it's not, it's terrible. Big government doesn't care about you the way family does. Big government doesn't have the ties and things that your family does to you. Okay. So debt is next. Let's see. What else did I put down here for poverty? Okay. Matthew 10, 8 through 11, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold, nor silver, nor copper for your bolt belts, no bag for your journey, nor two turnips or sandals or staffs, for the, labor, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. This concept here is... <clears throat> what he taught the disciples. Okay. And this is just how I understand it. I'm not saying this is all of Christianity, but this is how I understand this. He is telling them to go out and do good works towards people who cannot pay because they did not pay to receive what they have. It's this concept of go of pay it forward. Almost go out and do good because good has been done to you and do it without expecting anything in return, okay? Whoever will help you, stay with them. But don't go out here doing good, expecting things in return. And what usually happens, and you can see this all over the place, uh, I really gotta start making videos like that, but what you can see happen is when you go out and you help people without expecting anything in return, one, they don't know what to do with it, and two, they want to then help you. Because you're saying, okay, well, I don't really, this, you don't pay me for this or anything. Here it is. Uh, I hope you do well. And then later on, or even immediately, or whenever they can, they come back and they help you. So it becomes another bonding experience between people. So if you take that and you apply it to the government, where the government says, well, here you go. You don't have to pay the government anything, but uh, here's some money and here's some food and things like that. Well, you know what? That's actually a bad example because I don't think the government does actually have limits on how much money you can make and stuff like that before their help goes away. So there's limitations. There's uh, expectations to do with that. So that makes you kind of like, <laughs> it hardens your heart a bit to use the Bible verse. And this James 5 yeah, 14 through 16 is another one having to do with healthcare. And this one shows how it's, it's each other. It's not go the government. It's not go even to the church per se. Well, yeah, it's the church because the elders, but, um, 
it doesn't limit this to just like say Christians. So it says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So I'm sorry for all the burping. I'm trying to breathe through my nose so it doesn't happen as much, but it's not working. Okay, so there you can see, once again, it's people taking you somewhere. So this would be the equivalent of a doctor. So this is people going, taking this person to the doctor, and possibly even paying for it, okay? So how would that look today? I would take someone, I would be their ride to the doctor. I'd take them to the doctor and possibly even pay for their medication. If this is what a Christian, this is how Christianity views healthcare. It's not, I can't afford that, or it's not, um, <clears throat> well, let me see what the government will pay for. It's, wait a second, let me call two or three people and see if we can get this for you. And sometimes it means doing it for a long time. I don't see in here where it says, do it once and walk away. It's one of those things where it's like, consistent. And once again, there is a, there is like a hierarchy. Your family should be doing it for you first and then me. But if I am your family, then I should be doing it for you. All right. So the next one, debt, increase the debt to an unsustainable level. That way you are able to increase taxes and this will produce more poverty. Okay. So we kind of already covered poverty in that if anyone is poor, it is my job to make sure I help in the way that I can. If anyone is poor, then it's, you know, everybody's job, whoever's in that person's unit to make sure they have food, make sure they have water, make sure they can bathe, things like that. All right. So in order to cover this a little bit better, I have a couple more. So Proverbs 17, 18, a man lacking in sense pledges and becomes guarantor in the presence of his neighbor. All right, so this is about debt. Don't go into debt. Okay, that is the big thing. That is one of the biggest, I don't even know what word to use here, is the biggest thing that the Bible harps on is how I say it, is that you don't give, you don't go into debt. Don't do it. If you don't go into debt, they can't increase debt or anyone can't increase a debt to an unsustainable level because you just don't have it. It's not how you operate. It's not how you work. Okay. Proverbs 22, seven basically, um, echoes that a man lacking in sense pledges and becomes guaranteed to the presence of his neighbor or in the presence of his neighbor. So this is saying you don't go into debt and then don't help somebody do it. It's not right. You need to be free. You need to live within your means. And so debt doesn't become something that people can hold over you and take what you have. So Proverbs uh, 22, 26 or 27 is basically the same thing. Do not be among those who give pledges, among those who become guarantors for debt. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take your bed from under you? So this is the concept that debt will do exactly what this list says. (coughs) Excuse me. So don't get involved in it. And this is a, a money thing. It's one of the Bible has a lot to say about money. And like I said, this is the one it talks about the most is don't get in debt. Don't go there. Don't be that way. Psalms 37, 21, the wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. So if someone asks you for something, like in the previous verse that we were talking about, you are to give it to them however you can without expecting something back. This is a gift, is a gift from God through me. We are the conduit, basically. Romans 13, 8 um, echoes that. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. So Christianity is not huge on debt. It's not huge on, um, you know, going to debt to get this, that, and the other. And the way that it makes that possible is because me to this person, uh, I'll just call this person B, me to B. 
<laughs> okay. If B needs something, then me should step in and pay what I can. All right. If not, then I should be calling other people. I should be calling B's family, whoever I can get to help out. Now, that doesn't mean B is completely devoid of responsibility, but it does mean that B needs to do everything she can do. I need to do everything I can do. And the people around her, her family and friends and support group should do everything they can do to make sure people have what they need. Gun control. All right. So <clears throat> it says remove the ability to defend themselves from the government. That way you are able to create a police state. Now, I can only really find two verses or set of verses in here that have anything to do with, I guess you could say self-defense. <clears throat> And uh, so I'm just going to read those and then kind of explain my reasoning behind this. Luke 22, 35 through 39. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me and he who is numbered with the transgressors for what is written about me has his fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. And he came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives and the disciples followed him. And then later on in John, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? All right, so some context here is basically these are his disciples. He is teaching them, basically, the way I'm seeing this, okay, anyway. So he's teaching himself, teaching them to defend themselves, but correctly. So the way I see that is he's telling them in Luke 22, 35 to 39 to pick up the sword. And the reason you do that is to defend yourself. If you're a good person, <laughs> John 18, 10 through 11, he has used the sword. He says to defend, you know, he's thinking Simon Peter is thinking to defend God, but God doesn't need defense. We're the only ones that need that. We're the only ones who have to battle off like people with evil intent. Okay. So that is why I think he said, pick it up. But then he said, put your sword away in this case, because I'm going off to do what I'm supposed to do. So it's not have a sword and go havoc around and take whatever you want and <clears throat> self-defense yourself into something. This is actually just self-defense. Don't be going out there starting fights, but if someone starts it with you, then you have to end it. So once again, though, that, that's not relying on the government to do that. So for example, the liberals say all the time, you don't need guns. There are the police. You can go into like police response times and everything else. But ultimately, unless that policeman is standing right next to you, I mean, right next to you, because if they're down the road, even two roads down, they're still going to be too late. Okay. That policeman's not going to be able to step in between you and defend you. You have to be able to do that. And so once again, you are responsible for that though, not the government. And so this is again, Christianity is not about the government or other people doing things for you. It is very much about you and God and you and God going forward and doing it. And then he says, family should be close enough knit to where they're helping each other. And then outside of that, you have your church who can also help you. But it doesn't go through the church immediately. You understand? It's you do for yourself as much as you can. Your family helps you. Your church helps you. And then possibly outside of that, even the church could ask the community for help. Although I don't have scripture for that. I think it's just a logical extension of what he's already done. So the community, though, does not mean <laughs> government. 
okay? I, I need to be very clear about that because a lot of people say, well, community is your local government. No, I don't even mean that. I mean, like, maybe you have a bake sale and sell to the community or something like that. Perhaps you put out, I mean, nowadays you can do things like uh, GoFundMes and things like that where just complete strangers can help you. So something like that might be okay, but it is not a government thing. It's not, you know, the church has a government built inside of it. That is a real basic one. So that is for gun control. And this is another reason why I think a lot of Christians are against gun control, because you have to be able to do that. There, There is no secondary outside source that can help you, you know, other than God. <clears throat> who's going to be there just as quickly as they need to be. So let's go through this. All right. So gun control, welfare. So welfare and poverty kind of go together. People go on welfare welfare because they are in poverty. So it says welfare, take control of every aspect of their lives, food, housing, income. <clears throat> Again, 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith is worth than an unbeliever. So that's the, to me, that's all encompassing. Okay. When I read that, I understand that to mean, okay, if somebody's, somebody's having problems, then you need to help them, whatever it is. <clears throat> if they need income, you should help them get income. If they need to go to therapy, then you should help them go to therapy and they can't afford it. You see what I'm saying? Then you should be doing these things, giving them a ride. Um, one of my rules in life is, I don't care who you are, I'll always, I will always give you a ride to work. If you have a job, that's how you keep it. You have to show up. So everybody gets a ride to work and most people get a ride home. Depends on how far away it is and all that. But <clears throat> you can't keep a job unless you show up. So I'm the ride, whoever needs it. So, so where was I going with this? Okay, so welfare. So welfare, food, housing, and income. Once again, if you're not helping, I mean, this, the, all of these verses kind of go through it. I'm going to scroll back up in my notes to the, the, what was it, the four, five? One, two, three, four, five. The five verses that really cover all of this. And so Galatians is one I didn't read. Galatians 2.10, or sorry, 6.2. Wow, I messed that up. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, and that's me to my fellow Christians and then also in a way to the world because it shows God's love. And then Galatians 6, 10, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So this is just the encompassing. You do it to everyone and then especially the church, those of the household of faith. So do good, take them home, take them to work. If they need help, help them. You know, this is a very, it's hands-on for you. So if you're sitting here listening to this and you're saying, okay, so this, so I know this guy <clears throat> who can't always get to work. Well, is it because he doesn't have a ride? Well, you can be his ride, you know, and if you have a car. Excuse me, gosh, so much burping, I'm sorry. I think that's also why it says, as we have opportunity, because sometimes you're just not going to know Freddie down the road needs something, or you're not going to be able to help him. So, education. Take control of what people read and listen to in, and what they learn in school. So the Bible has a lot to say about education. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So we're supposed to be teaching the Bible to our kids and we're not supposed to be disciplining them to the point where they're angry. So I have experienced this in my life where there's just a certain point where every child's different. So your discipline has to be different with each child. So there's a certain point where any discipline just doesn't matter anymore for some people. And they need to just go out on their own and experience things. And uh, <clears throat> if you don't do that and you continue to sort of discipline or punish or whatever word you want to use, these people will become angry. And that's no good because they'll hold on to it. So he's saying don't do that, but do teach them. Proverbs 22, 6. 
train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I've sort of seen this in my life too, where, <clears throat> excuse me, hold on. Gotta get a little something. All right. I've seen this in my life where <clears throat> now that I've turned, like I'm past 35, I'm remembering a bunch of stuff that my parents taught me. When I'm out doing something, I can hear my dad's voice a lot of times being like, don't do that, don't do that. Okay, watch out, watch out. <clears throat> I have experienced in my life, in my 20s even, well, I'm putting my coat on and it just reminds me about how my dad would put our coats on. Or if I'm leaving the house without one, I can hear both my parents' voices, you know, in my head being like, put your coat on, it's going to be cold outside. Okay, so whatever you do with your kids, you're training them for a lifetime of not only learning, but of reminding, hey, put your coat on, you know, something as simple as that. Proverbs 23, 12, apply your heart to instruction and your ear to words of knowledge. <clears throat> so the Bible's very big on knowledge. It's very big on learning. And it's also very big on, from what I can tell anyway, from what, when I read it, and this is what I understand, you're supposed to be learning from everything. You know, apply your heart to instruction and your ear to words of knowledge, okay? Proverbs 24, 4. By knowledge, the rooms are filled and with all precious and pleasant riches. So to have knowledge controlled just by one thing and to have it be <clears throat> only one idea is not what Christianity is for. You should be exposed to all ideas. So let's see, how do I do this? Okay. So it says, take control of what people learn. So you can only say this, you can only learn this, you can only be this. As far as I understand it, the Bible is not for that, okay? It's for knowledge, just knowledge. Just learn as much as you can from all over the place as you can, because that is what will enrich, enrich you. Ephesians 7.12, I'm sorry, not Ephesians, Ecclesiastes 7.12. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of who, who has it. Deuteronomy eleven nineteen, teach You shall teach them to your children, talking to them when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So we're supposed to be a very educated people. This is not, this is not a, the, only the government can tell you what to learn. Only the government can say this, only this. It's not even only Christians can say what to learn. Only Christians can tell you that. It's not even that. Because as you see in Deuteronomy eleven nineteen, 19, <clears throat> you teach them to your children, which is the laws of God, talking of them when you're little, when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. So what is happening is that you're teaching your kids what God wants the whole time, every day, all day long. But also while these children are doing things with you, they're learning how to interact with the world. All right. And you have to have a worldly knowledge or a worldly learning to do that. So, for example, you're going to take your child out with you shopping. How you interact with people is going to be not only a godly thing, but a worldly thing because God says, you know, to interact a certain way. And they have to see it happen. <clears throat> so you're teaching them that. This would be like respect for all people. You look them in the eye and you say, hello, hi, how you doing? That kind of thing, just a basic thing, right? That's something my dad taught me. Now I was a very shy girl, <clears throat> so that was hard for me. So then you enter, you've already entered the store and now you're going through the products. Well, you have to teach them where the products come from, how they got here. <clears throat> you know, what it, you know, a lot of products now, you go into the produce section, they're from Mexico. What is Mexico? Where is that? They're different. And that's okay that they're different. They have different sort of, you know, they take a siesta in the middle of the day. Teaching them about the world. All right. So it's not 
when people read this a lot of times, like, oh, you only want them to learn the Bible. No, we want them to learn everything. We want them to know that people are different and that's okay. We want them to know that some differences aren't okay because it hurts these people, whether they know it or not. All right. Whether they know it or not, it does. Who <clears throat> wants them to know that God loves variety and that's why we have videos you know, that look like this, this, and this, but also, you know, God gave us dominion. So that's why we change things. <clears throat> We want them to know that not everyone believes what we believe. We, you know, you want a full and well-rounded education for your child. And that's what I see, or that's how I understand Deuteronomy eleven nineteen. Not only are you teaching your child how to deal with the world in a godly way, but while in order to teach them that, you have to teach them that everything is different from their house. You have to teach them about different cultures. You have to teach them about everything in order to get this understanding. So that's how I understand that. So I have a note here also, not just educate, but how to apply it also, Matthew five nineteen. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great. Excuse me. So this is an application verse. You need to apply them and you need to apply your knowledge, your understanding and your uh, like guidance from God efficiently and effectively. Not sit on the couch and think, well, I don't have to do that today. Because <clears throat> once you start thinking, well, B needs help and I just don't want to do it today. I'd rather keep this $5 and go to Wendy's or something. That that slothfulness is starts to work its way down and all of a sudden you're not doing all kinds of things you're not helping all kinds of people the whole thing falls apart and then yes now we're back to let's rely on the government <clears throat> which is not as you hope i've shown you here the way god wants things done so religion remove the belief in god from the government and schools. Okay, so they're saying if you remove God, you can control people better. I think that this is true. Just from what I've seen from kids coming out of school, but let's read Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So for a Christian, religion cannot be removed from the day to day. We are supposed to lean on God and his understanding of things and how things are going for everything okay this means a robust and intense education in life this means that we help each other when we need it this means that we don't ever stop doing that there there's not like a retirement this is always happens it happens until you die basically and that's how i understand that there are things in life I don't understand that I have to lean on God for because I just have to say, okay, well, that's what you want to do. I'm sure there was a good reason for it. I don't understand it, but there it is. Okay. And I, <clears throat> that's called faith. All right. So their last one is class warfare. Divide the people into the wealthy and the poor. This will cause more discontent and it will be easier to tax the wealthy with the support of the poor. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't usually talk this much. <laughs> mm -mm. All right. So <clears throat> let's do, let's look at this a little bit. I don't have a specific verse for this because like I said, there are six. Let me go back up that really, I think, cover that class warfare. Obviously, I don't care if you're poor or you're rich. If you're poor, I have a responsibility and a duty towards you. If you're rich, you have a responsibility and a duty towards the poor. Okay, I think that's why God makes people rich. So that they can use the money to help people. Uh, you know, family and all that. Putting people through education, things like that. <clears throat> so, Galatians 6.2, I think, covers this. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And Galatians 
So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Okay. <clears throat> that means not no one person is more or less than the other. Doesn't matter how much money you do or do not have, doesn't matter skin color, doesn't matter race or no. I don't even go there because we are we're one human race. Doesn't matter skin color, doesn't matter how much money you do or do not have, doesn't matter what kind of disabilities you have, doesn't matter. <coughs> These things don't matter. These it doesn't even matter, you know, the I'm a Republican, you're a conservative, or I'm a conservative, you're a liberal, I'm a Republican, you're a Democrat, doesn't matter, you can't afford your stuff. And I've got $5 that will help you do it. That's where that $5 is supposed to go. So this division, though, is very, very easy to do. This class warfare, as they call it. <clears throat> because we don't do these things. So it's very easy to divide people along those lines. Christianity, though, says don't be divided among these lines. Make it not matter. And you make it not matter by what you individually do every day, what you end how you individually, you as an individual, help other individuals. <coughs> mm. Sorry. It becomes almost roped to understand I'm going to need a little money to the side to help somebody out this month or this week. There's a lady I know keeps $20 in her pocket to do just that. That's to help somebody with gas money, help somebody with meds, help somebody give, give them food, take them out to eat when they are feeling down, whatever it is. And I think this is why so many people are against Christianity too, though. Because as much as people cry and as much as people say, well, we need government protection. We need the government to do this because people won't. <clears throat> they then look at Christianity that says, yes, you should. And you always should. It should never end. Whoever you're around needs your help. You should do that. Even if it's one person at a time. I mean, I don't, I just see no reason for this to happen. I do it. Uh, my husband and I do it. You know, I know other people who have done it. I've been in a Bible study even where one person didn't have a car payment and we all got together and gave $20 and that person could afford their car payment. Okay. I mean, this is just, this kind of stuff happens. You just don't see it on the news and things like that because of this list. This list is a good example, <clears throat> or it is a good example in my belief of how to break even just a person down. If you have no faith, you don't think anyone will do any of this, then you have no hope and you will not do anything until somebody comes along to rescue you. And God says, I have given you good things. You get up and you rescue each other. Okay. Now that's how I understand it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I've given you the verses. I've given you maybe a little bit to think about too. This also, you can also see this in like how America was formed. <coughs> Sorry, my dog's up here. I'm petting her. <laughs> you can also kind of see a lot of this in how America was formed. These Christian ideas are all over the place. So where I would say that maybe, you know, these guys, the guys who, George Washington and all them, who formed America were not overtly like Baptist or something. Every single one of them were trained on the Bible. They had Bibles that they read every day. They considered it a type of holy book. Even Benjamin Franklin, who took all of the supernatural stuff out of it and said, you know, no, no, not that. But this still is the best book ever written to build anything on. Okay, so the concepts in there he was okay with or he was fine with. He thought Jesus was a great guy. He just didn't think he was God. <clears throat> so these concepts that are found in here, these Christian concepts are very ingrained in the creation of America. 
we were expected to help each other. We weren't expected to have a large government to do it for us. And that's why they didn't want a large government. We, the people. And Christianity is very, we, the people. If somebody needs something, you're supposed to help in however you can. And you're supposed to know and, and be prepared to do that. So in order to do that, you have to be, you have to be forward thinking. You can't be somebody who is just all about, you know, YOLO, you only live once and I'm only going to do whatever I want to do today. You can't be that way. You have to be forward thinking. You have to think about the good of other people as well as yourself. Because if you're not doing well, you can't help somebody else. So you have to do well. Again, capitalism is very good for that. <clears throat> you have to do well in order to help others who just maybe could never do well. Because there are those people out there. They maybe don't have the mental capacity to do well. They have physical ailments or deformities that make it so that they can't do well. And God says it shouldn't matter. There are more of you who can do well than those who can't. And it's your job to help them. <clears throat> so that's just how I see it. I just wanted to cover this because I thought it was cool. If you have any thoughts, comments, criticisms, leave them down in the comments and let me know, guys. All right, and I will see you for the next one. Remember to pray and read your Bible and think about what I what was said here, guys. Seriously, this is a part of what God calls true religion. It's not, you know, just filling a pew in Sunday morning. So on that note, I will say goodbye, and I hope you have a great week.